Hello, fitness business nerds. What's up? Welcome to another episode of the Business for Unicorns podcast. Uh, I'm back this week with Pete. What's up, my friend? I'm excited to be back. Took a week off, came back with a tan. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, for those of you who are listening, I promise Pete has a tan. If you're on YouTube, you can see it yourself. Uh, but yeah, welcome back, my friend. How was your vacation? The, the good parts of your vacation. We're going to talk about actually part of it. But how are the good parts of your vacation? Oh, it was great. Um, a bunch of family time. Uh, my first tan in 20 plus years, I would say. Like real tan. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, just, I came back feeling energized. One of the physical therapists in our gym told me I had a bounce in my step today when he was walking behind me. And uh, I can feel re-energized. So if there's one lesson buried in here, go on the occasional vacation and turn it off. I was in, I was in uh, Caribbean waters and chose not to pay the exorbitant internet connection fees while I was on there. And yep. so I didn't have a, any type of connection with the outside world for all but two to three hours while I was on on land in Aruba just to check and see if there are any fires to put out, which there weren't any, but I feel really good now because of it. So we make our clients uh, deload periodically the volume of what they're lifting in the gym. We need to do the same mentally as it relates to our workload. Yeah, I think it's a great first takeaway for our listeners, right? It's just like, go take some time off as much as possible for you, right? Not everyone can take a whole week. Not everyone can go to a foreign country, right? But go take some time off in whatever way that looks for you. If it means taking taking a half a day to go to a park that you like and read a book, if it means uh, go taking a half a day, uh, spend it with a best friend, uh, hanging out, shopping, right? Whatever it looks like for you, take some time off and don't do work. I think Mark actually also did a YouTube about this topic recently. So go check out his YouTube channel. He's talking about this, the, the importance of really taking time off. Um, and uh, speaking for Mark, that's hard for him. <laughs> He's someone who really likes working. Uh, and certainly, you know, on his, on his recent baby, baby daddy journey, uh, he's been really needing to take time off. It's essential. Uh, and he, I think, talks about it on his YouTube about how much value he's, he's seen in that. Uh, so anyway, I think it's a great commercial for take vacations, friends. Um, well, it's one so, of the things I value about working with you guys is yeah. that when I watch when you guys go on vacations, you go radio silent. You're yeah. not you're not bad at communicating that. You make it very clear on the front end. If you absolutely positively need me, here's the way. But otherwise, plan yeah. on not needing me. And it just models the behavior that you expect of your peers. And so I didn't feel guilty saying I will not show up to record a podcast next week. <laughs> I will not make myself available for for emergency calls. I'm yeah. doing this for me and us collectively because I'll be better for you when I get home. A hundred percent. Well, here's the thing is, and we won't spend more time on this, but I think it's important to say this is that like, I absolutely care about my work. I want to do great work in the world. I want to have a great impact. I want to serve a lot of people. I want to help, you know, at least this work I'm doing right now, I want to help gym owners have, have, you know, better businesses that they're proud of, that are growing, they have freedom in their lives. And all my life goals are not about work. I also want to be a really great friend. I also want to see the world. I also want to be an amazing husband that gets quality time with my husband. You know, like there's so many other goals I have in my life that are not about the contributions I'm making at work. And I don't get to contribute to those when I'm working all the fucking time. (laughs) And so I just, you know, I think it's it's so often as entrepreneurs, we have this mindset that our value in this world and and everything that all the productivity we have in this world is about contributing to our work. And it's like, no, we have value and we do great things outside of our work selves. And it's okay to spend time in investing on those. Uh, so I wish we all did more often. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about the other piece of your vacation, which was not amazing. For those of you who follow Pete on social media specifically, I think you posted this on Instagram. Um, you had a return trip from your vacation back home that went horribly awry. We want to use this as an opportunity uh, to both, you know, let you vent for a minute about it, <laughs> get it off your chest, and also just use it as an opportunity to dissect uh, what went wrong from a customer service perspective. And, you you know, use the lens of like, okay, if we're going to talk about a, a failure of customer service, let's pick apart what we can learn from that and how we can apply it to our gyms. So maybe start by just telling our listeners just a little bit about like what happened on your return trip home um, that, that sucks so bad. Yeah, well, I had a bad uh, 36 hours, Mm. and I 
proceeded to handle myself like a petulant child on social media. <laughs> and I'm not going to use this platform to blast a single airline carrier, but I'm going to tell you what happened to me yep. as it relates to airports. And it's no news to anyone here in the States that air travel is not all that great these days. And we returned to the airport from our cruise ship and had a flight scheduled for noon on Sunday. I was supposed to be back in my living room by 4 p.m. that day with my tired wife and kids and our heavy bags and ready to kind of wrap my head around a work week. And we made it all the way to the gate for our on-time departure and then we're told that the flight is straight up canceled and we will not be given an explanation why. So that stung, um, but yeah. that happens. Sure. And sure. we were we were told to do two things: go to a customer service desk of sorts to reschedule, and while we are on our way there and in line for it, to try calling because if you call, you might get faster help. And um, speed matters in this circumstance because you're trying to find seats on other flights that are filling up fast with your peers. And so we went to that line, which ultimately was a two-hour long line, and I made that call and was told that um, by the automated system that there would be a $25 per uh, passenger fee for speaking with a service provider in real time to resolve this issue if I wasn't willing to try and resolve it via text in their application. And I was pretty pissed, I'm not yeah. going to lie, because my day had just been flipped upside down and our flight had been taken away from us and I was being told that it was going to cost me $100 just to talk to someone about possibly resolving this. Uh, so naturally, I didn't do that. Waited in the line. Ultimately, we were told that we could not get back into the airport that we came from inside of the next 72 plus hours. Mm -hmm. And that's where our car was. And so the solution that was most favorable was a return flight to an adjacent state uh, 26 hours later. And so a night in a cramped hotel room with my tired family and then mm -hmm. a day of travel when I was supposed to be at work and preparing for a day of coaching calls with Unicorn Society and mm -hmm. getting dug out from an extended vacation. And so that, um, that ended up being a flight that was delayed an additional four hours the next day, followed by a hour and 10 minute Uber ride to our car at the original airport, followed by a 45 minute drive home, which put me inside my living room at 12.01 AM today, which is Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm tired and cranky. And again, I didn't handle myself that well on the internet. And <laughs> it's not what the internet's had, for though. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's kind of what it's for. Yeah. <laughs> the internet is for acting like a, a, a privileged little idiot who just got off of an eight day cruise and lives this very entitled life. Uh, but what I walked away with and I cannot get past was not just a lack of empathy, but like the opposite. Mm -hmm. And um, I understand how difficult it is to sit at that customer service get desk and know that you're getting almost exclusively bombarded with people who have just had flights canceled or just sure. missed flights and they're stressed and they're agitated. And for that reason, I pulled my stressed and agitated wife aside when we got close to the front of the line and I said, look, we're going to catch more flies with honey than we will with vinegar. Yeah, we're going to walk up there. We're going to look them in the eye. We're going to be empathetic to their situation. We're going to thank them for taking the time to help us figure out an alternative solution. And then we're going to hope that they're going to bend over backwards to do us a favor because we're the first people to do that today. Yeah. Well, can I just could pause, not pause there and say, like, no one's doing that <laughs> right? as someone who's been at one of those desks for years. No one is doing what you're doing. So, like, already bravo to you. But keep going. Sorry. <laughs> well, it didn't work. I, <laughs> so yeah, that's it's insane. And I don't mean it. I don't mean it didn't work in the sense that that they were that they had options to give and they just didn't want to do me a favor. Sure. I mean, it didn't sure. work in the sense that they wouldn't make eye contact with me. They were so beaten down that they would not lift their line of sight to see us trying. Yeah, They wouldn't allow themselves to hear the tone in our voice. They, honestly, if I'm being dead serious, Michael, we walked up holding our two agitated, tired, stressed out, panicked kids, yep. hoping that there would be an empathy play there. 
and then put them down and let them step off to the side. We used all the cards we had. Using the kids I as never, props, you know. <laughs> I'd say we stood at that counter when we finally got to the front for upwards of 20 minutes. Wow. And the line behind us was well over two, two and a half, three hours long. And not at any single point in that conversation did somebody look me in the eye. Wow. And that really, really frustrated me. And yeah. it never went yeah. up from there. And it was... What, when we got the next day, the actual um, the delays and the time sitting in a runway waiting for flight actually um, became an, a similarly frustrating experience because the pilot was frustrated and he mm -hmm. was not taking any ownership of it and he was passing the buck and like telling the crowd why he was getting screwed, <laughs> telling us how air traffic control was cheating us on the flight path they'd pick for us and telling us that the rules are dumb. And it just didn't wow. leave me feeling good about my experience. Yeah. Oh, that stinks. That stinks. And, you know, I get that you, uh, you know, you just finished a great vacation. That's something to be grateful for. So I, that's heard. And like I said, I think I said this to you earlier, you're also allowed to be pissed about getting home because that sucked. Right. It really sucked. Not only to have things go wrong, because we expect things to go wrong in business, right? We expect, you know, there to be weather. We expect to, planes to break. We expect delays. Like that's part of it. But then for the fix to be fumbled so poorly, multiple times, in multiple times is really upsetting. So yeah. I so, didn't I mean, even get to the fix. Oh yeah. There, I mean, there hasn't been one yet in your home, but you, you mentioned to... there was, there was some sort of salt on the wound fix, I think. Right. <laughs> so if you're, if we're keeping score, yeah, we returned uh, roughly 36 hours after our original date. We missed my wife and I missed a full Monday. And hey, we speak to gym owners here. You know what Monday at the gym is. Yeah. Monday is like a microcosm of January 2nd for us every <laughs> single week of the year. Everyone thinks that their fitness lifestyle starts on Monday. On Sunday night, we food prep. On, on Monday, we show up telling ourselves this is the week. Well, my gym's packed on Mondays. My email mm -hmm. account is packed. Payments, programs that need to be printed, it's all packed on Mondays. And that got taken away from me unapologetically. The days, the two full days of summer camp that I paid for for my kids, gone. We ate that expense. I, just time, energy, resources, and the $500 in restaurant expenditures because we couldn't buy groceries in our crummy little hotel room and our 30 hours of meals that we needed to do, all of it. It was like an 800 to $1,200 penalty on mm -hmm. my family. And I walked away with a $50 credit toward a future flight. And I don't feel good about it. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what I expected. I don't know what my demand is. <laughs> I don't... I don't even feel comfortable telling people they owe me favors and comp future mm -hmm. things. I just had an expectation of them maybe stepping forward and saying, hey, we know this was a pretty big inconvenience for you. But if if I were earlier in my career and let's say I had a couple kids and I had a backbreaking mortgage or student loans and things like that, a thousand dollar day like that yep. isn't nothing. It's the whole damn trip. 100%. Yeah. And and we'd be absorbing that just like we are, but thankfully at a different stage in life. But that happened to a lot of people on our flight. There are a lot of people in that 200 plus passengers who got bounced, who are asking themselves, do I put the last two days on my credit card or do I sit and hold my breath and just hope that this airline does right by us? And they're not going to, and I get it. And I know, like, I had enough people who came at me in my DM saying, you obviously haven't been watching the news. This is your fault. And <laughs> so, <laughs> that's also so, what the internet is for. <laughs> so, yeah. to, to there's just, to there's been a lot you. of empathy shortages for me. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, like I said, I went on an awesome vacation. I am a cranky little kid complaining yeah. into the wind. Uh, but there are lessons, there are takeaways, there are things that got me thinking about um, how I can do a better job at the front desk at our gym, how mm -hmm. how I can do a better job fielding difficult feedback from clients. And yeah. Hi, listeners. This is a brief interruption with bad news. The bad news is after our last enrollment, the Unicorn Society is sold out. Since we pride ourselves on providing personal attention, we can't let anyone else in. But the good news is, we're building up capacity to open up a few more spots for our next enrollment period later this year. But this is first come, first serve. 
So if you're interested in working personally with Michael Keeler, Pete Dupuy, Ben's secret weapon Pickard, and yours truly, head to businessforunicorns.com slash unicorn to find out more about the prerequisites, learn about the program, and if so intrigued, get on the wait list for priority consideration for future spots. Now back to the show. Well, here's the thing is that even we just start with the low hanging fruit here of the things that would have cost them no extra money to do, right? Say, I'm sorry, look you in the eyes, <laughs> make it easy to talk to a human and get resolution, right? Anything like that, right? Any sort of compassion, any sort of humanity would have cost no one along the line any money, uh, maybe some better training could have helped provide that to you, right? Maybe some, some standard expectations, but, um, but that doesn't cost anything to the business to actually just treat you more humanely. Yeah. So I, that's where I would start this with this analysis is like, yeah, they could have just, <laughs> they could have just been more human along the way. Um, and you would have been, you would have been more, more, more happy with the outcome, not thrilled, but if someone would have looked you in the eyes and apologized and shown some compassion, it would, you'd be in a better place than you would be now and it cost them nothing. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I kept coming back to your quote from our recent podcast episode yeah. where you said, it's hard to hate people up close, Just lean in or step in. Yeah. And I, that was coming to me the whole time. And I even, yeah. I said it to my wife, Keeler said this thing to me the other day. I'm going to try and remember that when I get to the front of this line and yeah. I know that I'm going to be underwhelmed by the opportunity. So I'm going to try and yeah. lean in and, and have an actual conversation. And every time I leaned in, they leaned back. <laughs> it's kind of how I felt. Well, this this is, I think, one of the most interesting pieces of this interaction, and I won't get, I won't stick on it too much because there's other things to talk about. But the idea that this is very common in service professionals, right? And people who are frontline customer service agents in hotels, restaurants, airports, right? They are so beat down, <laughs> and uh, by by customers who treat them so poorly on a regular basis that they don't even know how to make themselves available on a human level anymore. They don't know how to make eye contact or have compassion or smile anymore because they've gotten so beat down by people just berating them. I, I saw it with my own two eyes. I used to manage teams of people doing customer service every day. And I would watch them just kind of give up the magic, the sparkle would just leave, would leave them. They didn't even know how to, they had such an armor. They had built such an armor to protect themselves that dropping that armor was just too risky over time. And I think that I just picture that person you were talking to just with a wall of armor up, just not even wanting to make themselves vulnerable enough to say, I'm sorry, or give compassion or eye contact. And so like, you know, I feel for you in the situation. And also we got to do, we got to feel for the people who are on the front lines. And I think maybe that's one takeaway I'd also suggest to our listeners is that your team's on the front lines every day, talking to your customers and clients in the gym. And not all those interactions are positive. Some of them have a real emotional toll, emotional cost. Some clients that come in really require a lot of your staff. So are you doing everything you can to make sure that they're still emotionally available, right? That they don't have so much armor up that they can't make eye contact or smile or create a positive environment. Like that's a really great starter takeaway from this, from this experience. I know that doesn't, you know, maybe do enough to honor your experience, but I, I think I like to think we can do both on this podcast. Like, yes, it sucked for you and your family and the person on the other end, clearly it sucked for because they couldn't even be available to you, which is why. Yeah. It, it, it struck me that they hadn't empowered their team to be creative in any way, but uh, I'll tell you what, if, if this uh, gate attendant or this service provider who was interacting with me, who saw my crying five-year-old in my hands, mm -hmm. agitated, had, had pulled a basket of lollipops out and been like, Hey, I'm so sorry you're dealing with this. Yeah. Would this make you feel any better to the kid? That alone would have changed the dynamic for me. Just yeah. that. Yep. And if you've have you ever read the book, The Power of Moments by Chip and Dan Heath? Yep. That that's what I found myself thinking about. Like, what what would the simple moment have been? The thing that could have kind of caught me off guard and just just disrupted me a little bit from this anger mm -hmm. that I was I was experiencing where they could they could just catch me by surprise. And I think that they on the way down, they they put the little wings on my kids backpacks, but they they're really good at doing the right thing in the easy moment, mm -hmm. but they weren't empowered to help us in the difficult one. And that to me is the fault of the people doing the training and the coaching and not the person who, like you said, 
has just been battered at that desk. I watched yeah. it for, like I said, for I'm two sure. hours. And I'm I could sure. see the outcomes coming before, like I could look at the people one, two, three, four steps in front of me. I could see them kind of preparing their argument to each <laughs> other in mm -hmm. real time on their cell phones. Everybody's yeah. agitated. And I could see the outcome before they got to the front. But I thought to myself, hey, if we have one advantage, it's that we're gonna we're gonna bring some sanity to this and yeah. we're gonna be empathetic to their situation, but it was just too late. We were too far gone. We're too <laughs> I far down the line. Anything. Too far down the line. <laughs> yeah. well, I think that's it. I think you know, your point's well taken is that, you know, at first we wanna make sure that, you know, we, we get to a place where these this these uh, folks on the front line don't get to a place where they're so beaten down that they can't just function at a basic basic level good listening, good eye contact, good compassion, right? And then on top of that, there should be abil ability for them to rise above and, above and beyond, right? To have a thing of lollipops, to have some bottles of water, um, to have um, some decent options and some, and, and the, the freedom, the autonomy to have some creativity to solve problems in a way that, you know, that really serves each individual person. A uh, quick anecdote about this. When I was living in Hawaii, working in the Four Seasons there, there was a, um, an earthquake and we lost power. Uh, it was like first thing in the morning. Um, and we did lots of things. To help. We didn't have power, I think, for a whole 24 hours at like a luxury resort with lots of people, no power for 24 hours. And, you know, um, people paying a lot of money per night. So reasonably, they were pissed. And the, yep. the feedback I heard afterwards about the things that they appreciated the most during that time that we did were the tiniest, dumbest things. The things that people said as they left that resort after having not having power for 24 hours were like, we were so grateful that people came around and offered us some free coffee in the morning. We we're so glad that people walked around the pool uh, and offered us uh, some free bottles of water and some free glasses of wine, right? Like it's like these little gestures that help just kind of articulate to them, this matters to us, your experience matters. We're gonna do all the hard stuff to get the power back on and fix all the things we need to fix. But we also wanna make these small gestures to say, we're here with you, we're in this together. And those are the things they reflected back to us as being meaningful. It wasn't that we refunded their thousand dollar a night rooms. It was the fact that we brought them some free freaking coffee that they really appreciated. Yep. In fact, because yep. we brought them the free coffee and the whatever else we kind of did for them, no one asked for the refund, right? No yep. one asked for the thousand dollars back per night, right? So I think it's 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 same kind of idea here. It's like those small little gestures to show that like we're in this together goes a long way. Goes a long way. Well, yeah. I, what are we, your I do your have other a, takeaways? Kind of one final thought on this, and that yeah. this is a difficult job. Training. Yeah. This is a specific type of training, mm -hmm. and it's a specific type of job. And I bring this up because that I spent several hours at the airport the following day as well. Mm -hmm. And I did have a follow-up question and they had, this desk was two computers, two people servicing that terminal. And at this moment that I walked by, while well, there was once again, a long line, there was a third person behind there and they were close enough that I could ask a question. And, and I walked up to them independent line and I said, Hey, is there any chance so-and-so is going to be working this desk today? Um, she was helpful yesterday. She wasn't, but, but I, I just, I had a follow-up question and he looked at me and he's like, you'll never see the same two people at this desk. Mm -hmm. And I said, why is that? And he said, cause nobody wants this job. We cycle it. And what it meant was every single day they were putting a new victim on the front lines who was not appropriately like professionally or mo emotionally prepared for what they were doing. And they showed up for that day, pissed about that day. They were angry yeah. before they started. And that to me was a, just a guaranteed failure. And if we're going to put, if we're going to open up ourselves to critical feedback, which we should, we need to put properly trained people on the front lines and that didn't happen yesterday. And so uh, if I have any advice, it's that yes, you should collect difficult feedback from your people, but you should make sure that somebody who has the emotional IQ to handle that properly is the one mm -hmm. receiving it and interacting with it if you can control that dynamic. And they could have, they just don't. Yeah, well said. I think that I think it's, it's, it's really important. If you're gonna have someone on the front lines that's gonna be dealing with customer complaints and for our clients, for you know our listeners, it's probably the person at the front desk who gets get this kind of feedback on a regular basis if you have a front desk, right? Um, and if not, it's the person who answers kind of the main emails that come in is often the person dealing with these kinds of complaints, but they should be well-trained, not just well-trained well, well -trained on to how to, how to um, 
how to like soothe and appease, but how trained on how actually to, to be empowered, to go above and beyond to solve people's problems, to show compassion and empathy, right? Like that's the training that they really need. Uh, and you know, I think that's important. I'll also say this as maybe this may be my last thought on this is, which is there's some foundational customer service elements that are just missing here, right? Which is, you know, we all are going to make mistakes in our business. We're all going to drop the ball from time to time. That's a given, right? No matter who's listening, you work on business, it's going to drop the ball. The most important thing, and the research shows this, we talk about this research in our Clients for Life course um, we, on the customer service section, is that most people will be willing, will forgive you if you resolve their issue, and they'll forgive you even more and stay forever if you resolve it quickly. And the resolution doesn't always have to be financial. The resolution can be an acknowledgement, an apology, a gesture of some kind. And if you, the more quickly you do it, the research shows, the more likely they are to forgive you and stay. And so I think you, all our businesses just have to be prepared for how we handle dropped balls. It's not a matter of, of, of if, it's a matter of when. And just knowing that this is how we respond. And certainly, you know, we can talk more about that maybe on a future podcast. I think actually in the past, Mark and I did a podcast about a system we use called Glows and Grows. So if you want to search back on our podcast listeners, you can listen to kind of our system at MFF for capturing customer complaints and resolving them quickly. But that's the name of the game of customer service. It's like, yes, it's great to be, as you mentioned earlier, it's easy to give good service when things are going well. <laughs> that's easy. Everyone's having a good time. It's easy for me to smile and be a good customer service representative, right? Uh, when shit hits the fan, that's what you need the training for. That's what you need the systems in place for to acknowledge and resolve those complaints as soon as possible. When you do, people will forgive you and they will stay, but you have to resolve them quickly. Exactly. Yeah. Anything else you would add here, my friend, my before we wrap colleague, things up? Yeah. My colleague, um, Andrew Millett, our physical therapist here is, is fond of saying or describing this as writing the final chapter, which I think he may have taken from Danny Meyer's book. Mm. It's that's where I feel like I heard it, but it is his mindset. I can mess up, but I'm, I have the ability to write the final chapter in this story. So what am I going to do about it? And it's easier said than done, but it is the option that all of us have. So something yeah. to think about. 100%. Well, I hope the airline writes a final chapter for you that you like reading. We'll see. Yeah, they're not going to, I'm not going to hold my breath and I'm not going <laughs> to complain about this. <laughs> Well, well, we'll leave it there, my friend. Well, thanks for sharing your story. I mean, this, as tough as it was to relive, I think it actually is really helpful for our listeners to hear that like, these are moments in your life where we get to put our entrepreneur hats on and our student hats on and be like, what can I learn from this? I don't want to treat other people this way. I don't want other people to have the same experience. How can we do better in our business? So, you know, thank you for being a human laboratory <laughs> for our learning. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it. This has been therapeutic. <laughs> Good. All right, listeners. Well, thanks for listening. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, give it a thumbs up, like it, share it with your friends and colleagues, and shoot us an email. Let us know what you want us to talk about next. Pete at businessforunicorns.com, Michael at businessforunicorns.com. Until then, I'll see you on the next one. Bye. See you. Before you go, one final note. If you haven't checked out my YouTube channel yet, head to markfisheryoutube.com. I post videos twice per week and I cover all sorts of topics and tips to help you be even more successful at running a training gym. From time management to financial benchmarks to lead generation strategies, I have got you covered. Thanks in advance for subscribing and sharing with your training gym owner friends. My mission is to get this content out to every gym owner in the world. So your help means so much to me. Remember, that's markfisheryoutube.com. See you there.